Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, joined here today uh, by Professor Tom Marwick, who's uh, director of the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm sure he's familiar to you all. Um, uh, my name is Mark Monaghan. Uh, I'm director of non-invasive cardiology at King's College Hospital in London, but in my capacity here today, uh, I'm here as associate editor-in-chief of ECHO Research and Practice. Uh, and Tom and I are here because um, this month marks an important landmark in the publication of joint guidelines from the British Society of ECHO and the British Society of Cardio-Oncology um, on, on guidelines for transthoracic echocardiography assessment of adult cancer patients uh, receiving anthracyclines and or Herceptin transusumab. Um, so uh, Tom and I are going to discuss this publication because the important thing, as I say, is it's going to be simultaneously published in ECHO Research and Back, um, Practice and Jack Cardio-Oncology this month. So Tom, just to get kicked off, I mean, simultaneous publications do happen all the time, but, but what do you think is the significance of when something like this comes out in, in two journals together? Yeah, first of all, hi Mark, and thanks for the invitation. It's great to join you. Um, Look, I think it is a mark of, of something that is important and noteworthy. Um, you know, the, when this works most effectively, the, the readership of the two journals are different. And, and I think that's, that's the case here, that, that we're talking to imaging folk and we're also talking to uh, cardio-oncologists, general cardiologists, and, and hopefully also to the oncologists. So it's a, it's a means of, of expanding the target audience. I mean, that, that's actually a great intro into one of my later questions, which was, you know, who do you think it's really aimed at? Is it cardiologists or uh, echocardiographers or oncologists? Yeah, look, I, well, it, it's clear that all of those audiences need to hear this message. Um, you know, no matter how good we are at imaging, you know, we're, we're, we're not contributing if we don't get referred the right patients at the right time. And uh, so there is a part of this story that's important for oncologists and, and in particular, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in other parts of the world, people are still using nuclear gated heart pool scans, which probably in the current era are, are not the best test. They, they don't have the, the kind of sensitivity to pick up minor changes of function, which you really need to for this kind of task. So, so some of this does need to go to the oncologist, but some of it is very appropriate for the echo folk about how we, how we do the studies and in particular, how we should be focusing on the LV assessment in, in a way that is probably more meticulous and obsessive than, than we might usually do. Yeah, I, I should of course mention that you're a co-author on this uh, on this guideline document and, and I would agree, I think parts of it are definitely written for the echo folk and, and, and part of it for the oncologist. So hopefully mm. a lot of mm. people will, will get things out of it. So, but, but do we actually need it? I mean, there are guideline documents out there already. So do we really need a new echo protocol for for these group of patients? Yeah, look, it's a legitimate question. There are probably, you know, sometimes in my in my durest moments, I think there's more reviews of this topic than there are primary data. Um, I, look, I think that there is still value because uh, in particular, some of the new echo markers such as global longitudinal strain perhaps don't have the level of penetration that they should do. Uh, you might even say that's true of 3D echo. And I think both of those parameters are important for a serial assessment of left ventricular function, which is really what this is all about. Uh, it's not so much that we are able to measure ejection fraction or GLS to the closest 1%, but then when, when we compare from one test to the next, that it's a meaningful comparison. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's an important point for us to talk a bit about a bit later on. So, so what are the, the, the key areas that you see that this document actually covers? Um, look, I, I, I think it has some, as you say, some aspects for everyone. It has some aspects that relate to pretest probability. And clearly, if we established a, a really intricate protocol for following people on chemotherapy, you know, it's not going to be possible to apply it to everybody that's taking a chemotherapeutic agent. And so um, I, I think some of those, uh, some of the commentary about clinical assessment of risk is important. Yeah. And a, a lot of it relates to the assessment of LV function and in particular the serial assessment of LV function. Um, and uh, I think the emphasis is made that really um, 
2D Echo is probably not up to this task on its own. Uh, I, I'm, I'm injecting some of my own bias there, and I, I don't think that the the review is that is 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 that strong. But uh, but I think that there are some inherent problems with test retest variability with 2D Echo, which you can overcome with the use of 3D or GLS, or indeed if you only have 2D, the use of liberal use of contrast. Uh, is a means to, to overcome this, and, and all of those get, get airtime in this review. And of course, you've published extensively on those areas in the past as well. Um, so, so why is it that you know, 3D and GLS have been around for quite some time? Uh, you, you and I have been teaching it together sometimes, mm. you know, over many years, mm. but it's still not universally used, and it's really important, as the document says in a second. Why do you, why do you think that is? Oh, look, I think some of it is a sort of natural inertia that you see in medical systems generally. I, you know, I think oftentimes it, it, uh, things stay around longer than they should do when they get superseded and the, the new te technologies don't necessarily get picked up as rapidly as they should. Um, some of this is, is the introduction of, of the techniques to the routine. And um, I, I think we've seen in many instances in ECHO that if you try and pigeonhole a new technique to a particular scenario, like, you know, you only do um, global longitudinal strain for cardiotoxicity cases, then it's going to be harder to introduce. I mean, I, my preference in the lab is, is for, for, for longitudinal strain to be used pretty well in all echoes whenever the image quality is adequate. Um, and look, uh, you know, everybody's busy. The echo exam seems to get longer and longer as we pick up new things and, and you know, and, and we haven't discarded things from, well, let's face it, getting on for 50 years ago um, that, that really we've got better tools for now. So all of those things are contributors, but I, I think it's really important to realize that to an extent our questions have changed. You know, if you, if you went back 20 years ago, they were questions about LV function on a cross-sectional basis. And now we're asking really quite elaborate questions about myocardial mechanics on a serial basis. And, and we need different tools for that. So uh, in terms of workflows of the lab, and I agree with you, I think you know, unless these tools become routine for everything, they won't, they won't be used. But there are some, some automated and semi-automated software mm. now that, that improves potentially the analysis of 3D Echo and, and GLS. Do you think they have a role to play? I, I absolutely do. So you know, we, we're quite interested in this and we had a, a, a paper recently in JACE about this because I, I think it's really a very important practical consideration in ECHO labs. So the answer is that prognostically, um, if you get a normal GLS on an automated uh, assessment, then it, it probably is normal and it probably is very favorable. If you see an abnormality on an automated assessment, then you need to be patient and go back and, and analyze the data yourself manually. Because quite frequently, um, and this is particularly the case with poor quality images, there's difficulties with tracking. But uh, yeah, I think automation has got a very important role to play here. And I see that increasing in the future, especially as we miniaturize and hopefully you know, move the technique from the echo lab to the hands of the oncology nurses uh, or, or the oncologists themselves. And presumably they help reduce variability as well, which would be very important in this context. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, the, the, the worst extreme is that you're consistently wrong. So, so you know, there's, there's two sides of the equation, but, but, um, but, but that's not the case there. They, 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 are, they are reliable and, um, uh, and I think they're very feasible and useful. Yeah. Good. Now, the document, you've already mentioned this, but the document recommends the use of contrast when uh, mm. image quality is suboptimal. Do you, do you think it is better to use contrast or go for an alternative imaging modality in a patient like CMR? Sure, I think that's very dependent on what resources you've got available. So, um, you know, in, in Europe or, or the UK, I, I think you've got very wide availability of CMR. Um, you know, in this part of the world, um, you know, some of my patients live in, in pretty rural and remote areas and, and, and they simply don't have feasible access, certainly not for serial imaging. Yeah. So I think it, it relates to what's, what's accessible uh, locally. Certainly CMR is a, is a very good technique for serial assessment um, and, and that's very attractive. It's just the process of, of, of getting that number of people to have having sequential assessments is not a trivial undertaking and, and uh, you know, those resources are needed. Well, I mean, that brings me on to my next question for you actually is, I mean, how important is it that the same imaging modality 
is used for serial assessment in these patients? Oh yeah, I think it's absolutely critical. I, I mean, although we, we've been using ejection fraction for more than half a century, the reality is that that our evidence base with it has been built with different imaging modalities. And um, uh, th those numbers don't, don't necessarily mean the same thing. Uh, so, so yeah, I think if somebody starts their follow-up with ECHO, they should continue it with ECHO and similarly with CNR, CMR. And for global longitudinal strain, the, 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 the nature of the post-processing software is really an important consideration as well, okay. not just the, manufacturer but but also actually the the software generation and sometimes for people that are being followed over a significant period of time that may require going back to the images and reprocessing them on on uh, the current software so um, detecting small changes in ventricular function as you've highlighted is really important uh, and in order to be able to do that labs presumably need to do some kind of quality control measure the inter and intra observer variability mm. I mean what would be your your routine in your lab how, how do you actually do that on a regular basis yeah we think this is very important so um we uh, recently published the one year results of the secure trial a, a randomized trial of of uh, global longitudinal strain for assessment of cardiotoxicity and one of the one of the major efforts there was to make sure that everyone was concordant to start with and although as you can, as you say, the software is at least semi-automated on the machines. You, you'd be amazed at the amount of variation that human beings can can put into a, a process. Um, yeah. And, and I, th I think that there is a there is a need in the first instance uh, for uh, the use of some uh, reference images. So we have some uh, up on our website, and if people want to get in touch with me, I'm happy to help. Um, obviously, it's something can be done locally as well. Interestingly, in that trial, once, uh, first of all, there was a pretty short learning curve. Um, so people that had used strain before didn't need to make major changes in terms of a, 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 a learning curve. Um, and that once the lessons had been taught, they tended to stick. Interestingly, they tended to stick for GLS better than they stuck for, for ejection fraction. Really? Uh, so, so it is, it, it's something I think it's important to get to concordance to begin with, uh, like all echo quality control, it is something that's done, that should be done sequentially, but, but probably the sequential aspect of the training is probably no more important than it is for, for other uh, modalities. And, and certainly here in the UK, um, as part of the British Society of Echo Departmental Accreditation, quality control and reproducibility is, you know, is part of that, that, mm. we, that all echo labs have to do, but, uh, but I'm not sure that it's universally adopted. No, I think you're leading the world in that, actually. I, I think it's extremely important. And, um, it, you know, the, the, the trouble is that it's, it's, you know, it's not an exciting thing to do, but it is just a really important practical detail. And, uh, you know, the worst case scenario is that you have referring doctors not, ref, you know, referring their patients on particular days because, the, you know, they have a they have a particular set of answers that they get on that day. And it's <laughs> obviously very destructive. So, um uh, no, I, I think you, really you, that's a fabulous initiative. It's terribly important. Uh, good. So, so Tom, one sort of final discussion point about this uh, guideline document, and we focused in our discussion very much on LV systolic function, but the document mm. also refers to assessment of diastolic function and also RV function. So how, how important do you think they are in the assessment of these patients? Yeah, so there's an evidence base for both of them. I, I, I must say that uh, you know, again, I'm attracted to the feasibility and the reliability of, of particularly global longitudinal strain. Um, and for that reason, it's my go-to measure. Yeah. Um, but there's certainly an evidence base to show that diastolic function changes with cardiotoxicity, as does RV function. And I think that there's a, there's a place for both of them. I think the balance, obviously, is how much effort you put into each, and particularly if you're getting patients back on a pretty frequent basis and you've got a, a high workload, you know, whether, whether uh, you need to direct an, an equal amount of energy to them. And I think the answer probably is a bit dependent on exactly what the scenario is. If you have somebody to begin with who has diabetes or hypertension where they probably have some abnormalities of diastolic function, yeah, that's probably worth tracking pretty carefully. Uh, if you've got somebody with chronic pulmonary disease where the RV is not completely normal to begin with, similarly. So that's how I would approach those rather than necessarily using all three of them all of the time. 
yeah, well, that sounds sounds very very sensible. So, I mean, Tom, I don't have any more points, but is there anything you particularly wanted to raise out, out of this document, or any any issues you'd like to highlight? Yeah, look, I think it's an important document. It's not very long, and I would really encourage people to to read it and and engage with this. And I think some of the lessons it teaches us about sequential assessment are going to be very important in the era that we're going into you know if you think about cell therapy or other more sophisticated things that we may do for for lv dysfunction this process of following people sequentially is going to be with us and, and going to grow more important so i think those are important lessons i guess the last thing is just to just to reiterate possibly a statement of the obvious that that lv dysfunction in this situation is not heart failure and, and so i think we're a little bit glib when we talk about cardiotoxicity defined on on pretty arbitrary grounds as a 10 percent reduction of ejection fraction to less than normal or a more than 15 percent relative change of gls um, this doesn't need, mean to say that the you know the ventricle has been irreversibly damaged um, but it is a signal that there that there are some consequences from treatment and and i think usually the appropriate response is to add some cardioprotective therapy uh, rather than uh, stopping the agents, which is, I think, another important point that uh, that this review makes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there was, I, I know, because I supervised the review process, there was a lot of discussion about that, or those particular points in it. So, uh, you know, I would urge everyone to look out for the publication. It will soon be available in Jack Cardio Oncology and also Echo Research and Practice. And I'd like to thank John Marwick for his time uh, today discussing it with me. And I hope you all enjoy this and I hope you'll enjoy and get something out of the guideline document when you get to read it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Mike.